All right, let's move on to part two. How do you actually use this in an instrument? Now remember that we've got this whole setup. This is how it looks in the instrument. And the one thing that is added here, you have the light coming in, the light coming out. You have um, the prism and the gold chip, and you have the liquid on the bottom. But notice how on the bottom, you don't just have a vat of liquid, you have a flow channel of liquid. The flow channel is moving the liquid through, and you can have something attached to the surface. Right here, you have these little red upside down Ys attached to the surface. So you can have something attached to the surface, and if it sticks to the yellow thing that you're flowing through the flow channel, then you'll have something approaching the surface. It changes the refractive index, and when the refractive index changes, the angle of absorbed light will also change. The shadow will also change, and you have a, an angle shift from one to two, and you have um, that's interpreted as a resonance signal, a response unit that goes up. So what you actually see is you see this graph right here. The sensor gram is what the Biacor will show you, and it will show you, you flow the yellow thing over, the yellow thing sticks to the red thing, the red thing causes an increase in the resonance signal, which you will see, and you can just interpret this as, oh, I have something sticking to my surface. Or, at the very least, I have some type of resonance uh, change, which means some kind of refractive index change. So you'll have this happen if you have a mass change at the surface. You also have this happen if you inject something with a different uh, refractive index. And this is sensitive enough to detect if you're injecting something with a different salt concentration, that different salt concentration will cause a different refractive index as well. So, SVR does have um, some things you have to watch out for. You have to be sure that the signal you're seeing is real. So this um, flow channel is part of an apparatus, a part of the instrument called the IFC, the Integrated Flow Complex or Channels or things like that. Integrated Flow something, okay? Uh, integrated flow cartridge, okay, so it's integrated microfluidic cartridge. I have it on this next one. And what you see right here is that the, the, um, the flow cartridge has a lot of channels in it, and those channels are like wires for the water to flow through, and you can move different kinds of water through different channels. And you press that down onto the sensor surface, which has um, the gold on it and the prism, uh, which will actually, uh, the prism will actually change the, um, produce the angles and produce all the effects that you're looking at. So, the, um, the way that it usually looks, most Bia cores have like four flow cells like this, and they're in order. So you, you can flow the liquid through flow cell one, flow cell two, flow cell three, and flow cell four. You see right here they have these open and closed valves for circles. The, um, the little circles are little valves, and the way that it actually works is the IFC is actually made of rubber, and you'll hear all of these little hisses of air moving in and out. What the air is, is the air is pressing down on the rubber and closing in. It's actually sort of pneumatic, okay? It actually closes, it opens and closes the valves depending on whether the air pressure is there right, right there. So the B core is actually a pretty noisy machine because it takes um, air to open and close the valves. Now, most Bia cores, I said, have four, four flow cells. Ours only has two. And so we have two flow cells, flow cell one and flow cell two. They're arranged in a U shape like this. The reason why this is important is as you're flowing something through, you will see its effect on flow cell one a split second before it shows up on flow cell two. And this is a picture of the IFC. You don't really have to know too much about this, except that this has this shows you all the different valves and the different paths that the water can take. The instrument knows what to do with all this. We let it do its thing. But the main thing that you can see down here is you can actually see one of the valves down here. You see there's a rubber sheet, and the air will actually pinch the valve shut if you don't want water to go that way. And um, so the computer controls all that and you'll hear that, don't be alarmed when you hear either the hissing of the air vents or the sudden kick in of the air compressor. It has to keep the air compressed at a certain PSI to be able to um, pinch the valves shut. And so, 
the, the thing that uh, is above the IFC, you'll have the actual gold chip. And on the gold chip, you have a surface that you can attach things to. And so um, the, that's the, the called the sensor chip. And I actually have one right here. It actually looks kind of like a stick of gum, OK? Um, but what this is, this is just a plastic case. The real thing is inside the plastic case, there's a chip right here. If you look very carefully, you can see that there is a gold surface on that chip. In fact, it's so thin, I can actually see through it. Um, I don't know if I put it right up here. I don't know if it, can you see through it. Anyways, whatever it is, you can see that's actual gold right there. Um, the chips are about $100 each, and most of that probably is not the cost of the gold. But maybe, you know, $10, $20 is actually the gold in the chip. So it, it's... Um, it's actual gold right there, and you can also see that it's pretty small. You want to keep the volume small, the surface area small, and the good news is you don't have to use a lot of protein. Uh, you can keep the concentration small. On the sensor chip, you have to have something to attach your stuff to the gold, and so they sell you all these different types of sensor chips. The kind we use is the most commonly used type at the top. It's called the CM5 chip. Uh, it's for having a dextran layer, which is just a sugary polysaccharide layer, like seaweed floating on the, on the gold, attached to the gold. And that sugar has been carboxylated as much as it can be. They basically put carboxyl groups. And if you remember from organic chemistry, carboxyl groups are negatively charged. And so you have a bunch of negatively charged groups on seaweed that's sort of attached to the gold surface. This is what they use. You can buy other kinds of gold, um, uh, of s things attached to the gold, or you can buy just a plain gold surface. Some people use it that way. But we are going to use the sort of default CM5 chip, which means it has a lot of carboxylation sites for us to use. And the reason why we use those is we use the most common Biacore attachment technique to take our proteins, and we're going to attach it to the gold surface. So you can see that pretty much you talk to your organic chemistry friends, and they will tell you, you know, um, oh, you can do these different kinds of, or, of organic chemistry to be able. I wonder if I can zoom in a little bit this way. Let's see. Um, I'm really not sure. This is uh, probably as much as I can zoom in. But these are four different types of uh, ligand chemistries. But these, these are just four ways to form uh, covalent bonds. And so you, um, you actually have over here, you have the really small little uh, COO group, the carboxylate group, and you add these reagents called EDC and NHS. That forms this weird aldehyde style of bond. This is an insusimidal group, actually, is what it's called. And the thing about this is this bond is really easily attacked by an amide. And so if you have any amide, and if you know um, the, pr the protein amino acids, there's a lot of them that have amides in them, especially like lysine is, uh, definitely has a primary amide, uh, primary amine on the end of it. I've got to be careful because I mean to say amine, not amide. So that shows you my organic chemistry flub for the day. So you have the primary amines will react and they will displace this incest middle group, and you'll have an amide bond that is formed which is a hard-to-break covalent bond. Once you have the protein coupled to the surface, it is not coming off. Anything that you do to release the protein from the surface will probably damage the protein itself because it'll go after all the amide bonds in the protein. So once you couple a surface to a chip, you don't have, you're out of um, other uses for the chip. The good news is you can reuse the chip over and over again. So we'll probably be making a couple of chips, but I'll, um, I believe I will do this chemistry for you, and yet in the lab report, I'm going to ask you to look into it a little bit and see exactly what's going on. It's really a pretty simple two-step uh, sort of synthesis uh, step if you want to look at it from an organic chemistry perspective. Now, there are other ways you can form, uh, you can use uh, thiols to form disulfide bonds to attach. You can use um, aldehydes to attach, but um, that requires an aldehyde on the protein, which most proteins don't have natural aldehydes. Uh, many proteins don't have exposed cysteines, and so you can't do thiol coupling. 
So most people do amine coupling because the amine cu coupling, every protein's got some kind of lysine or something like that on its surface. The one down here, malamide coupling, I don't even know what that is. So we're going to use amine coupling. And amine coupling is a pretty good chemistry technique for attaching proteins to something else using covalent bonds. Uh, in fact, the exact same chemistry of what we're going to use is actually, I found it in this recent paper, uh, which just came out, which is a totally different kind of application, but it's the same chemistry. What you have is you, you have a technique that makes fingerprints glow. What they do is they have little glowing nanoparticles that they are going to attach to the fingerprints. They spray it on the fingerprints. It attaches, the fingerprints glow, and what's better than a fingerprint that's uh, colored and you can like pick it up on tape? A fingerprint that's glowing is even easier to detect. So that's what this paper is about. And this right here shows you the technique. You have the nanoparticle, and the nanoparticle has COO groups on it. So what they do is they use EDC and NHS and that creates the sesamidyl groups on the end. And then you spray that onto the, the fingerprint. And the fingerprint is going to have a lot of proteins in it with a lot of amines. And you see that the amines will form covalent bonds. And then you have covalently bonded nanoparticles to the fingerprint itself. You shine an LED on it, and it's actually going to glow. Same chemistry, different purpose. So once you get that uh, chemistry on the chip, then you have it inside the BioCor instrument. And you basically then tell the BioCore to do a lot of different injections of different concentrations of the binding partner of the protein that you have attached to the chip. In our case, we found that it works best to take, uh, we have two proteins, fibronectin and plasminogen, that we found bind the domains that we're working with. And so you attach the fibronectin and the plasminogen to the chip using the amine coupling chemistry. And then you're going to flow over different concentrations uh, of the analyte, is what they call it. So they, they, uh, it's going to be the 4A domain. You're going to have different fragments of the 4A domain. I'll explain a lot more about this in part three. But we're, we're going to have something attached to the chip. Its binding partner will be flowing through. The binding partner is going to bind. When it binds, refractive index changes, and you get a response unit change on the BIACOR. So the question is, what's the machine of the BioCore that's moving all the water around for you and injecting the samples? Well, let's start at the top end. This is the top end BioCore T100. And you see it's all sleek, and it, it looks like the newest model. Um, it looks like an iMac, actually. Uh, and you have the thing that you can see is you have pumps that pump the liquid through. You have the optics and the microchannel flow system that we've described to you before. You put the chip in. And you have a needle which will go around and it will inject the different things into the flow cells. OK, that's really nice. But we don't have this. The next one down is the BioCore 3000. This is the one that I learned to use 16 plus years ago. Uh, the BioCore 3000 is, um, looks like this. And you can see this also has, you see this, uh, this area up here? This is where you put your samples in. And it has a little robotic arm that moves around and injects the samples for you. And then you sit on the computer, and you let it um, give you your data. We also don't have this. We don't have the robotic arm. But the thing is, what we do have is we have all the optics in the flow cell. And the optics and flow cell that we have are actually almost as good as the optics in the BioCore 3000. We just don't have the robotic arm. That means you are going to do your own injections. Now you see why we had a pipetting exercise in the first week of lab because you're going to be pipetting. That's the BioCore X right here. And you can see it kind of, uh, it's uh, much smaller than the other ones, but it's got the same basic components. There's a door over here where you put your chip in, OK? And in the body of it right there, you have your prism, your chip sits in there, and you have the IFC that sits below it. And the IFC, by the way, the rubber is orange. And when you get in the lab, you'll be able to see a little orange bit of the IFC sort of sticking out. Then you have the inlet for the buffer. It's actually just a syringe that's the pump. It's pretty simple. And the syringe like pulls stuff up and pumps it through. It passes through. It does all its valves opening and closing. And it passes it over the chip. And it goes out into the waste right there. And you sit and you look at the computer. And you see the data. So there's all these steps to a BioCore experiment. 
And um, we've already worked on it, and we've found out which ones will work for our particular situation. We've already decided which chip to use, which molecule will be the ligand, and which one will be the analyte. That means which one do you attach to the chip, and which one do you flow over. Um, you prepare the, the two samples, and you choose your immobilization strategy. We're choosing amine coupling. And so then we're going to do steps five and on in the lab. You have to pre-concentrate your ligand on the chip prior to activation. This is what we'll do in our first week in lab. Then you immobilize your ligand onto the sensor chip. Um, then you inject your analyte and record your response. Step seven is what you'll be doing repeatedly to be able to get repeatable results. Then you might have to do what's called regenerating the surface. Regenerate the surface is step eight. And then you can repeat step seven after you regenerate the surface. And then step nine is analyze data. And we're actually going to be doing that two different ways. Lab three, we're going to do a simple data analysis. We're going to keep the same data. And in lab five, we're going to do a complex data analysis. So the pre-concentrate, what does that mean? Immobilize ligand. Like I said, I believe I'll do that for you this year. And then step seven, inject analyte. That's what you'll do. Analyze data. That's what you'll do as well. So what BioCore is really useful for and the whole thing about BioCore is that you're collecting data in real time. So you're not like mixing something up and then, um, then measuring it. You're kind of mixing as you're measuring. And you're mixing in and you're able to see really quickly what goes on. And so that means that when you inject a protein onto the surface, you see the response go up. The, you inject a protein. The protein approaches the surface. The response goes up. You see the protein approaching the surface. And most protein kinetics are actually um, slow enough that you can actually see them with your eyes happening in real time, appearing there on the screen in front of you. So usually you, when you do a protein assay, you see how much of the protein is bound after the assay is done. Here you see how fast it is binding while the assay is going on. And that means that you do an injection, you inject your protein, you see it associate, and you see it dissociate. You notice that both of these curves are actually curved lines as well. And they actually are both curved uh, exponential functions. That will be explained in lectures uh, for chapters 6 and 7. But the main thing is that shark fin shape, the shark fin right here. This is what BioCore data will look like when you can measure not just how much. How much is how high the line gets over here. But how fast is how fast is the line curving? So here's some example of different proteins that binding uh, that bind at different rates. Some of these are faster and some of these are slower. So here's like uh, human antibodies that are binding other things, and they're they're seeing how the antibody binds its antigen, and you can see that you have very different shark fin shapes to the curves. Some of the fins um, like stick for a long time, like this one. You in inject your stuff, the line goes up. And by the way, right here, you stop injecting it, and you let it fall off. It falls off really slowly. But this one right here, you inject it, and it comes on kind of fast. But then you stop injecting it, and it falls down really fast. This one has faster kinetics. It's still binding a lot, but it's binding quickly and also falling off quickly. And that could be relevant in a biological situation. Biology cares how fast as well as how much. And that's what we can see with BioCore. Here's two examples of shark fins for two different interactions that have the same affinity. They have the same equilibrium constant of binding. But they look very different because they have different kinetics of binding. They have the same how much of binding, the same big K, but they have very different rates of binding. They have different little k's. And so here's an example of um, four compounds that have the same big K. It's 10 to the minus 8th molar is their big K. But the, the four compounds of the four different colors, they actually have kinetic constants that are very different. And you can see that the green one right here will actually um, goes on very fast and falls off very fast. The red one, on the other hand, goes on really slow, but it also falls off really slow. So that those could have very different um, rates of binding. If you were just measuring equilibrium affinity, just measuring big K, 
you would actually get the same number for both of those. But if you're measuring speeds of binding, you actually find out that they're very different. And that could have a difference in how they work uh, on a biological level, have a difference in which one's a better drug. So the important equation, and we'll get to this a lot later in the class, but this will be important for lab five, that the big K, KD, is equal to the little k's in a ratio, the k off over the k on. And if you look carefully at these numbers, you'll see that each of these has the same ratio between k on and k off, but they have very different k ons and k offs. Notice right here, when you get to the maximum binding, the maximum binding is the same for all of these. It's just that you never get to it because you don't have time to get to it with the red line, but the green lines get to the maximum binding. So that maximum binding means that you, you have your, your target protein that's bound to the chip. That one is maxed out with being bound to its binding partner. That is the maximum binding of the chip. And so we call that the maximum response of the chip, or the R max. So um, they actually do a cool kind of plot in Biocor where they actually use this KD, uh, big KD equals little KD over little KA. And they do a graph where you have little k's as the axes. And that means that the big k's are going to be diagonal lines because of the ratio between the two axes. They're going to be diagonal lines up and down on this graph. So here's an example of three points, three different compounds that fall on the same line and have the same big KD, but they have very different little KD, little KAs. We actually um, find this kind of graph to be useful when we're looking at kinetics. Again, we'll talk about this more when we get to that chapter at the end of the, of the book. The main thing is, when you're running SPR, you're looking for this shark fin shape. And you, um, at first you're injecting just buffer, and then at time zero you start to inject your purple stuff, your purple and yellow stuff, which is the stuff that is binding to your surface, that is going to be bound to your surface. In our case, we're going to be injecting the 4A domain. The 4A domain is going to stick to the matrix protein that's going to be attached to the surface already, and the response will go up. You'll see it sticking. Then we stop injecting right here, and the response starts to go down. We'll see it unsticking. Now one of the things is sometimes, a lot of times, it sticks a little too well. We want to move on to the next instrument, the next experiment, and we don't want to wait for it to like fall off on its own. So we want to nudge it along a little bit. In that case, we might add a chemical which will disrupt the interaction and push the yellow stuff off, bring the response back down to zero, and get this stuff unstuck. The solution that does this, that causes the sharp drop that you see right here, they call that a regeneration solution. And really what it is, is any kind of solution that has a chemical property that it will disrupt the interaction between your two proteins, um, and it will peel this protein off. Hopefully it's, not, it's harsh enough to break this interaction, but not so harsh that it unfolds your proteins, because if you unfold this protein, remember it's covalently bound. If this protein gets messed up, your chip is messed up. So it's the curved part that we're going to be looking at, and it's how we, we, it curves that we're going to be analyzing for in lab five. The flat part is what we're going to be analyzing for in lab three. That is how much is bound. That is related to the big K, and that's what you'll be doing first. And you'll be walked through how to convert the data from the flat part into an equilibrium constant. The important thing is that you, you only reach equilibrium after you uh, inject for a while. You let it curve up, and once it reaches the flat part, the flat part is the equilibrium part of the curve. So here's another way to look at it that shows the different kinds of injections down here. Uh, th they have um, the shark fin shape, where you inject right here, you inject right here, you see association, you stop injecting, you see dissociation, and then you um, gathered all the data you want, so then you regenerate it by applying the chemical and kicking all that stuff off. And hopefully if your regeneration conditions are the right kind, you end up back where you started, with the same baseline, with an open set of proteins bound to the chip, that are now ready to bind another partner, okay? This is called a sensorgram, 
It's a plot of resonance signal, of the um, RUs, or response units, versus time. The only other thing to point out is that um, 1,000 RUs is equivalent to a change of 0.1 degrees in the resonance angle, so this is really sensitive. But 1,000 RUs is also equal to one nanogram of protein per millimeter squared of chip surface area. Because we know the refractive index of proteins, we can use these to calculate what our expected response is and how much protein we have actually bound to the chip and available for binding to its binding partner. One other thing that happens in the BioCore is you notice that we have two flow cells. And we actually use those two flow cells to help us, um, to help us uh, subtract out an effect that's otherwise kind of annoying. Okay? It's called the bulk contribution. And remember that w what we're really measuring is we're measuring changes in refractive index. And something that has a different salt concentration actually has a different refractive index. So how do we account for this? If you, you're just injecting salt and you see your signal change, well, that's not what you're looking for. You want to subtract that out. So the way that we do that is we use our two flow cells. Remember that it was flow cell one and flow cell two. We bind our, um, our protein, our ligand protein, to flow cell two using the covalent um, binding technique. And to the flow cell one, we bind nothing. We leave that one blank. And so if we have just a salt solution moving through, if it just changes the refractive index, it's going to change the refractive index in both flow cells, flow cell one and flow cell two. But if we have a specific protein binding interaction, the protein will flow through flow cell one and the protein will stick to flow cell two. So what we do is we subtract flow cell one from flow cell two, subtract the signal, and that means that the, the salt effects and the, the resonant um, the refractive index changes and all that are just automatically subtracted out. Um, I'm going to show you what this looks like in the lab, but you don't, um, you won't be necessarily seeing it because the computer is going to be automatically subtracting out this for you. So this is one reason why we, um, why we use the BioCore the way that we do. We have an automatic subtraction for refractive index changes that are non-specific. Here they call it the bulk contribution. The only other thing, I already mentioned this about regeneration. This is just another way to do it. Regeneration just means that you remove your bound analyte, remove our domain 4A that's still stuck to the surface. And the important thing is you want your experiments to be repeatable. So you want, uh, after you do regeneration, you want to, and if you do the same thing again for cycle two, you want to see the same thing again. If you have accidentally gone too far, and if you've unfolded some of your protein on the chip surface, then it will lose activity. And actually, any protein chip will slightly lose activity over time. It's just a fact of life. And so the question is, does it have about the same activity as it does before? OK, then we have a good regeneration condition. If the chip is losing activity, then we better change something to try to preserve that activity. So the kind of regeneration solutions that they suggest, they suggest mild solutions because you don't want to unfold the proteins, you just want to break up the interaction. And uh, so you, have, you can have weak, intermediate, or strong types of regeneration solutions. Um, they suggest different kinds of acid, different kinds of ethylene glycol, um, different kinds of uh, salts that you can put through. And we've actually found one that seems to work really well for our 4A interaction that we're going to be looking at. And so we will have that available for you to use. So the power of BioCore is that you don't need a label. You can detect the kinetics of anything that has mass. And so that means that you can detect proteins, you can detect nucleic acids, carbs, lipids, uh, even low molecular weight compounds. Although, because it's related to molecular weight, if you have too low of a molecular weight, you may not be able to see anything at all. Okay? You can even use whole cells, and there's a possibility of us eventually trying to do some kind of that with the whole cells of what we're interested in. The drawback of BioCore is that you do have to modify something. The covalent modification that you do to attach it to the chip is a significant modification. Okay? And so that means that you 
before you run the organic chemistry, you better be sure that it's going to at least have a chance of working, which means you have to be sure that your protein can approach the chip. Now remember that our chip has a lot of carboxyl groups on it, so that means there's a lot of negative charge on the, on the chip that we need our protein to approach. And so what we do is we try to get the protein to be a positively charged protein that will, uh, that will be attracted to the negative charges on the chip. Then we can do our covalent chemistry and we can lock it in there. Preconcentration means that we're trying different pHs and we're changing the charges on the protein to try to get to a charge that is going to be good for the protein that's not unfolded or anything so we don't want to go too far. But we do want the protein to be able to, um, to uh, be attracted to the negative charge on the chip. So um, we need to keep the buffer pH above 3.5 because below that pH we start to protonate the carboxyl groups and we need those to be negative. Usually some mildly acidic pH is what works well for us and we found that pH 4, pH 5, we found some conditions that work well for that. But that's the first thing you'll do. You'll be testing these because we use that with an unmodified chip and we see what happens. So what you do with uh, pre-concentration, what we'll do in lab on the first week, is you'll just be injecting some proteins at different pHs onto the chip, and you'll be seeing how high the response goes. The higher the response, the more protein is actually approaching the chip surface. So we haven't activated the chip yet. We aren't covalently immobilizing yet. And so this is a, actually a real low stress kind of way. Week one, you really can't mess it up. And so we'll be able to practice on the machine and then you'll be able, actually, the stuff you're doing in weeks two and three, you won't be able to really mess that up too much either. Um, this is a pretty straightforward technique, and uh, you'll be able to collect some good data fairly easily. The way it's going to look, the chemistry, remember that the chemistry that you do, you run the EDC NHS chemical over it, and that puts the first group on, so remember we have that two-step organic sort of mechanism that we had in, on the earlier slide. The way that two-step mechanism looks like is that you actually see step one, you inject the chemical, you see step one, and you actually, if you look closely, you can see the response go up a little bit, even in the baseline. That means that you have all those little incessamidal groups attached to the chip now. Then you put your protein on, and hopefully your protein approaches the surface because you've, you've found a pH at which it will approach the surface. And when it approaches the surface, it displaces all those incessamidals and it forms covalent amide bonds. When you're done with that, hopefully your baseline is still higher because now you have a bunch of protein bound to the chip and you have a higher response from that chip. Its refractive index has changed. Then you do a blocking step because there might be some leftover groups that have not reacted and so you react them with a, um, a chemical called ethanolamine, and then you're done. So you do this once per chip, and like I said, I think we're going to share chips, and uh, depending on when you sign up for time on the instrument, um, you'll have a chip waiting for you ready to go. So the cool thing about Biacore is that you can pass anything over the, uh, the chip, and as long as you have a good active chip, anything that binds will be detected. You don't have to modify the stuff that you flow over the chip. And so, for example, these are 384 hybridoma samples uh, were screened to select antibodies. These are actually passing cells over the chip. And you see that they did a bunch of these. They had a robotic arm, so they were able to do a whole lot more of these than we can. And they, they were able to measure the on and off rates for the cells sticking to the surface. The cells with the faster on rates and slower off rates have the higher, the better antibodies because you want an antibody that's going to bind fast and it's going to be slow to come off. And this part of the graph has the high affinity, the hybridomas that were producing high affinity antibodies. And um, so they were, actually, um, they were actually running the crude samples over the chip and they're able to get good results from it. And so that's the power of Biacor. Now I want to talk about the specific project that we're going to do. So that's going to be part three.